So what I have prepared for today is that I would like to discuss the defaultable version of our discrete forward rate model. So if you use the historic term for the forward rate, the LIBOR, then that is called in the literature, the defaultable LIBOR market model. And um, yeah, the, the formulas on the slides are maybe a little bit complicated and there's also a little bit more stuff to the modeling here. We have a jump process factored in to the model. Uh, but apart from that, I believe this is a nice session yeah, because there are a few modeling aspects that give you a nice intuition and also give you some, some clues what you should maybe consider as a modeler. Yeah? So modeling is uh, really to some extent also an art yeah, to choose the right quantities to model to make the right coordinate transformation. And uh, a little bit we are touching these points. And um, a second remark is, um, this is now a hybrid model. So we are actually modeling two interest rate curves. Uh, there is the risk-free, the default-free interest rate curve, and then the defaultable curve. And this is maybe part of a family of um, hybrid models. So if you think of hybrid models, Then there is the first part is what is the quantity that is creating your numerea? And we will stay in the same uh, numerea, so on the same numerea. So we will use actually our discrete forward rate model, the one without the default, to model at least the numerea. So as a basis, yeah, there is here our model for the L. Which will give us the numerea. And now you have a model with a stochastic numerea and you can put other quantities on top. So for example, you can do Black-Scholes model for a stock, but assuming that now your numerea follows this stochastic process. So it's not e to the rt with a, with a constant r. It's now Black-Schultz model with this uh, numerator. And you can, you, you can do this. It's uh, easy. Yeah, and I had a session uh, on that. Not in this lecture, but there is one. So there's a model on, of a stock on top of this. You can also consider um, a cross-currency model that models a foreign interest rate, but you are the domestic investor, you still have that numerator. So we had a session on that and you also had a small uh, assignment on that, creating a small cross-currency model. Okay, and um, all these guys now built on, on top of this number. And what I would like to do is today the defaultable curve. And then you can build a very rich model, modeling all these quantities. You can also have a foreign defaultable curve or a foreign stock yeah, combining now uh, these aspects. And well, building these model is, models is not so complicated if you have seen one of these guys. And really now the defaultable version is maybe the most uh, interesting among these guys. The others are a little bit similar, but this uh, default reversion has the issue that we need the jump process that models the default. Okay, so let's start. Uh, we already had a chapter where we looked at default. So we introduced the concept of, of default and we introduced the defaultable bond. Well, idealized uh, 
a CEO Copa bond, but there is some event that he does not pay uh, the unit at maturity. And we then derived a very simple assumption. Uh, we assumed that the implied survival probability, so the ratio of the defaultable bond and the non-defaultable bond was deterministic. So we had a nice little assumption assuming that this quantity is deterministic. And then we could endow any model um, actually with, with the adjustment factor of the survival probability. And yeah, we, that was an easy um, extension and already our non-defaultable model had this extension of either applying this um, adjustment factor. And what I'd like to do today is to really make a richer model. Uh, I would like to assume that the credit spread, I will define this guy. Uh, so actually the difference between the non-defaultable and the defaultable forward rate is stochastic. So we will look at a model with a stochastic uh, credit spread. And we do this within our discrete forward rate model. So that means this model is defining our numeraire. And we really need this. Uh, I have a small comment on that. So here in this model, the credit spreads, so the quantities that define somehow um, the difference between the non-defaultable rate and the defaultable rate, they can have their own Brownian drivers. Okay, so let's define the quantities. So we have the non-defaultable bond here. Okay, and you know that we can define the forward rate or the discrete forward rate from that. Uh, ah, I see there's a typo that should be an I in the, uh, instead of the K. Uh, okay, so maybe just fix the typo here and write that K is equal to I. Yeah, so bond at the beginning of the period TI minus bond at the end of the period TI plus one divided by bond at the end of the period divided by the period length. And now we could just define uh, the same object for the defaultable bond. So we have here our defaultable bond, uh, same, same little typo here. Same little typo here, the K should be equal to I. Um, <clears throat> so we have our defaultable bond, so that's this object here, the P superscript D, well, which we can observe on the market. And then we can define the same object. So actually it's not so clear if this object has a meaning what it is, uh, but if we observe the price and if it's not zero, we can define this. And uh, based on these two objects, I now define the spread. So the credit spread on the forward rate, which is just the difference of the defaultable interest rate and the non-defaultable one. Um, well, usually the defaultable rate should be above the non-defaultable. Yeah? So I, I have to pay more interest yeah? because the guy who is lending the money yeah, likes to have covered his risk of not getting back the money. Um, so, uh, well, I would expect that S is uh, a positive quantity. So then uh, maybe I already mentioned that there is um, a recovery. And now there is an interesting first aspect with the recovery and the relation to this credit spread. So what is the recovery? The recovery is the amount that you receive in case of default. Idealized for the uh, very simple defaultable bond, we assume zero recovery. So it's either we get at maturity one or we get nothing. So we can use our defaultable zero copper bond. Uh, we, can we can make this assumption that our, that we observe the defaultable uh, zero Cooper bond that becomes instantaneously worthless. So it jumps to, down to zero and there's no recovery. So if we make 
this assumption, then we can interpret the ratio of the defaultable bond with zero recovery and the non-defaultable bond as a survival probability. So we had discussed this in the previous session. So we can define here the survival probability, which is the ratio of the defaultable bond with zero recovery and the non-defaultable bond. If you have now a defaultable bond that pays recovery, so I denote this guy now with P superscript DR, and I assume that the recovery it is paying is now here this quantity, is now here this quantity R of T observed in little t. So then either I receive one unit at maturity. So this is the non-defaultable bond. I receive this one unit at maturity with a certain probability. So that is my survival probability. Or in case of default, I receive the amount R so my recovery, so that is in case of non-survival, in case of default, I received that. And here the R of T observed in little t is already the discounted. So the expected discounted value of the recovery. So it, it means I either receive um, a non-defaultable bond with a certain probability, or I receive that value evaluated in little t. Yeah, so it's f little t measurable with a certain probability. So I can just split the value of my um, defaultable zero copper bond with recovery into these two parts. So you see that this first part is just the defaultable zero copper bond with zero recovery. So you receive one with a certain probability. That's just our defaultable zero copper bond with zero recovery. You could also say that this part here, so our survival probability is actually defined by this object. Okay, then I can also represent this part here as the ratio of the two zero copper bonds. So I have the defaultable one divided by the non-defaultable one here. Okay. Um, and yeah, so you, you, you see that uh, Yeah, or, or, or maybe let me let me uh, tell it differently. Uh, there is the word now discounted here. So this means that this guy here is already evaluated at time little t. So, but you can now think of the model that you receive a certain amount recovery at maturity. So it is um, that you can think of receiving in capital T either one unit, which is the payment of the non-defaultable bond, or you receive, say, R, no? so a fraction. You just receive a fraction. And then if you now like to value that, you would perform a discounting to evaluation time. So that's my little t. And you see that is now the R times the zero copper bond that pays that time capital T, yeah? so the non-defaultable bond. Um, 
So you see there's this relation here. If we perform the discounting, I have this relation here between the recovery which I receive at maturity, assume that I would know how much I would receive at maturity, um, and this valuation. And often you just assume that you know a certain recovery at maturity. So you would receive 40% of the amount that the bond pays at maturity. This is also maybe a nice model because it will somehow level out defaultable bonds with different maturities. Yeah? So why should a defaultable bond that has a very large maturity and has a smaller value because there is a higher risk or the longer you wait for the money, the smaller is the value. Why should that pay the same recovery as a bond that has a very short maturity and um, has a higher value? Yeah? So you would assume that the fraction you receive is somehow um, proportional you know, to actually the time value of money. Um, so it's much nicer to assume this Sorry. So it's much nicer to assume here this form for the recovery. And now if you plug that in, you, know, you see that I have here R times P of T. Uh, so then this guy here cancels and you have actually the non-defaultable minus the defaultable bond here inside. And you can now express the defaultable bond with recovery as a nice interpolation of the non-defaultable bond that was here our P and the defaultable bond with zero recovery that was here our P superscript D. And it's just an interpolation with the recovery. And you see, if you have recovery zero, then this is just the defaultable bond. And if you have recovery equal to B1, then you just have the non-defaultable bond because you will just receive exactly the one unit at maturity. Okay, so we will use that model. So here, this last line uh, to model um, a defaultable bond that pays a recovery at maturity. And you already see that within this whole framework, there is a model within the model. You can assume different ways of how you would model now recovery. So often this is used, yeah, recovery are paid at maturity and um, then also often R is just a constant. Yeah? So it doesn't even depend on little t. So even, even simpler. Having this defaultable bond with uh, some recovery, so let's denote this here with now the dark queen. Yeah? Uh, actually, I can also define a corresponding credit spread. So the credit spread is the difference between the defaultable forward rate and the non-defaultable forward rate. So I can maybe just write this here as, well, then I would have here an LK superscript D, the defaultable forward rate. Um, but now the one that has an associated recovery that is just here this sum, yeah. So the spread is the difference of L superscript D R and the um, L, the non-defaultable L. And I can just use now the ratio of the two defaultable bonds with two different maturities to define this, say, synthetic object. And you see that for different recoveries, you would maybe get here different spreads. And this is now the first um, yeah, interesting aspect leading to the question, what, are, what is the good quantity we should model? Huh? So actually there are now many quantities that we can model. We can model the forward rate, we can model the spread, and we can use a model for different recoveries. Yeah? So what, 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 what's now the, the model? Um, but the nice thing is this, that there is now a relation between the spreads of the different recoveries because we have here this 
relation. Yeah, so where a bond, ah, no, it's not working. Okay, so maybe I should use a different pen. Why, why is that, that sometimes the pen is not working? This is, I hate it. Was it also before? Okay. Okay, let's start over. So we can now use here this relation for different recoveries and relate uh, the spreads. Okay, so here's just so here's just the relation from the previous slide. The defaultable bond that pays recovery R is actually uh, an interpolation of R times a non-defaultable bond plus one minus R, a defaultable bond that pays no recovery. And if you now plug in the definitions of these guys, so this here is now defined with our synthetic forward rate that contains here this spread. And of course, I also have here the, oops, the non-defaultable bond that is related to the non-defaultable forward rate. And I have here the defaultable bond with zero recovery that is related to our definition of the defaultable forward rate that I could, which I could define with the defaultable uh, spread. So I have here this uh, relation. And now you can solve this relation for SKR and see that actually the SKR here on the left-hand side. Uh, so This part here is just a function of the forward rate and the spread with, without recovery and the chosen recovery. Another interesting thing, and that's now important, is what happens if you let this guy here go to infinity? So if this spread goes to infinity, it means that, okay, one divided by one plus L plus spread is the bond. It means that actually the value of the bond goes to zero. So it means that the probability of default is getting higher. The probability of survival is going to, see, uh, to zero. So letting the spread go to infinity, paying a large interest, yeah, is just a compensation for default. Letting the spread go to infinity means that it's much more likely that you default. But if you do that now in this equation, you see that this part here goes to zero. Okay, so you see that this part goes to zero. Uh, nothing is happening here in that part. Okay. And on the left-hand side, I can now solve for the SK superscript R. And let's have a look what is happening to the spread uh, of a defaultable bond with a certain recovery. And you see, okay, you can just take the inverse. Yeah, you take just, uh, you just uh, flip it. And then you move here this one plus L plus delta K to the other side, yeah, and you divide by uh, the um, delta TK. And you see there is just a formula that this spread depends on the interest rate L, the recovery R. Okay, so this formula looks like that. So you have one plus LK times delta tk, the period length. And then you have a one divided by r, okay, which is because I took the inverse. Let me change this so I can, yeah. So because I took the inverse here, yeah, I have a one divided by r there in front.
that is here. And you have a minus one because there was one plus L delta TK on the other side, which I move now to the other side. And you have this expression. And you see that if the bond becomes more and more defaultable, so if the issuer becomes more um, and more likely to default, the spread of a defaultable bond with recovery has an upper bound. So there is an upper bound on the spread if we define it through a defaultable bond with recovery. And that's clear because this bond is to some extent non-defaultable, namely the friction R. So if it is very likely that the bond defaults, yeah, so it's just that the defaultable part goes away, but the recovery part is still there. And that's what we see here. You also see that um, the recovery is a fraction you know, between zero and one. You know, so otherwise we would have maybe an arbitrage. Uh, so you see that the quantity that is here is between zero and uh, uh, something. Yeah, so a one divided by R is uh, larger than one. Um, so you see for R equals one, I just have a zero here. So the spread is zero, but the bond is indeed non-defaultable because R is equal to one. So this upper bound is important from a modeling um, perspective, uh, not so from the mathematical perspective. Yeah? We could write the model in terms of a recovery related spread, but from an implementation aspect and also from a modeling ex uh, aspect, if you would like to model now the S with an ETO process, it's maybe a bit difficult to um, model an ETO process that is respecting an upper bound. And even if it is from a mathematical perspective, not so difficult, so actually we could just use the previous formula, apply ETO theorem, and we immediately see how the process looks like, then it's maybe not so nice from a numerical point of view. So let me, let me conclude the yeah, discussion a little bit of this recovery aspect with this remark. So in practice, the default event is defined by maybe a complicated set of conditions. So if you have a financial product that explicitly references the default, yeah, then yeah, for example, a credit default swap, then the event is defined in the contract. And it's for example, failure to pay um, or bankruptcy, yeah, which is a little bit different from failure to pay so that in your balance sheet, you are negative or something like that. Um, so there are some conditions that define this event. And in some parts of our applications, it's maybe not so important to directly know the event. And also it's maybe not too important to model um, the recovery. Yeah. But uh, the recovery is in practice determined by a complex process. Yeah? So that in the event of default, they are checking the balance sheet, yeah? they are checking the assets and maybe there's some kind of auction. Yeah? You can buy the defaultable bond yeah? for a reduced price yeah? and then wait uh, how much money you get back. So that's maybe a complicated process. So, if, you, if your model depends a lot on this recovery part, then maybe you could also model the recovery as a stochastic process. So you can make some more complicated assumptions um, on the recovery and have a stochastic recovery. But here, um, I just assume that it is a constant and that we know the R. So let's go back to this uh, point here. Uh, the spread with recovery R has this upper bound. You also see from this, if R goes to zero, then the upper bound is vanishing. Yeah. So then the spread is between zero and um, infinity. 
So this brings me now to the question, what is the object that we should model? And we had this remark that we can model spreads with different um, recovery and you can do this. But if you think back uh, of our implementation sessions and also the remark that I made for the Euler scheme, if you would, for example, model the spread using um, here this log normal process, yeah, because you would like to have the spread to be positive or something like that. Uh, if you think of this, remember that if you perform an Euler scheme on this stochastic process, then the property that this quantity should be non-negative is not preserved in the Euler discretization. Yeah? So in the Euler discretization, if I do not go to the log space, then I have here this term. So in the first step, I'm adding a normal distribution. So in the first step, the X can become negative. So we had this here on this page. Maybe we can go that, yeah, discretization of the log normal process. And that was one motivation or one example where it is nice to actually move to a different coordinate. Yeah? So maybe you remember that. Um, and we have a similar problem here. Yeah. So now I have um, a stochastic process. If I assume a certain recovery, there's an upper bound. And that's maybe not so nice to model. And even if we can write down the model, it's maybe not so nice from a numerical aspect because we have to check that our numerical discretization is not crossing this bound due to approximation errors. So we have a clear motivation to model the spread of the zero copper bond with zero recovery and use our little transformation formula to calculate the other one in case uh, we have um, an issuer where we know a recovery. So you see that I'm, I'm modeling for maybe a numeric reason, I'm modeling a synthetic quantity, the zero recovery spread from which I then will calculate the um, R recovery spread if I have some recovery assumption. Okay, so in summary, we choose now uh, the S K, so this is the recovery zero spread um, as our model primitive. So I would like to model this object. So what is now the dynamic of the object? And this section is now a little bit similar to what we did again and again for other models, for all the hybrid models, it's always the same. Uh, I write down an ETO process and there is the question, what is the drift? What is the risk neutral drift? If I move to the equivalent Martingale measure, how does the drift look like? And you maybe remember, uh, how was that done? You are looking for financial products and then divide the financial product with the numerator, and you know that this has to be a martingale and you are looking for financial products that contain this object, the spread. Okay, which financial product would that be? The defaultable bond. Okay, so I write down the model dynamics. Um, we still maybe have the question, are we modeling the forward rate, the L superscript D. So this guy here, or are we modeling the spread? We are now maybe focusing the zero recovery case. Um, and there is another aspect here with the modeling that will make life a bit more difficult for the defaultable model. If you look at this definition, I just wrote this definition a little bit down. Yeah, So maybe this is some kind of synthetic object. But if we now assume a zero recovery, we have the issue that the defaultable bond may have jumped to zero. Yeah? So if the default fault event occurred, this bond is worthless. So in that case, the definition does not make sense because I'm dividing here 
by the value of the defaultable bond. So if I would now simulate this quantity or the spread, uh, maybe I have some kind of an issue because, um, yeah, how would that Monte Carlo simulation look like? So maybe I draw here my time axis. So there's your time. And uh, here I have the L, yeah, the defaultable L, maybe different L, so what, whatever. Yeah, so I just draw maybe one. And so let's maybe say it is Li, and then here is the period from Ti to Ti plus one. So you know, in the non-defaultable case, uh, you have some, some rate, and then at that point here, the rate is uh, fixing, fixing at a certain value. Okay, that is the non-defaultable case, so that would be here the Li without the superscript D. And now the defaultable guy um, is actually moving uh, up and down, and then the default event happens. So bam, yeah, now the guy is default, and the definition stops. So, but the default time, it's a stochastic time, yeah? So that default event can happen on different paths uh, at a different time. So maybe here it's a bit later and here it's maybe a bit earlier. Yeah? So that default time happens at different times. So if this here is the path, say omega five, yeah, then this here is the time tau of omega five, okay? So the default time, so suddenly the path stops. So this is now my defaultable forward rate. So this is my, the green one is my L superscript D for different sample paths. And I also maybe have simulated the Li Ooh, and maybe, to be precise, yeah, the the non-defaultable interest rate is maybe a little bit lower, yeah. So the initial value is maybe a little bit lower. Uh, apart from that, that's the, these are maybe different different sample paths. Okay. So you see in this uh, modeling of the defaultable forward rates, there are many small problems. Oh, okay, my, my mobile phone is making noise. Let me, let, me, let me just make it more silent here. How can I do that? So request if I would like to have something to eat. <clears throat> So you see in this modeling of the defaultable quantities, yeah, there are many small interesting issues. Yeah, recovery, yeah, which which rate do we model? So we have answered that maybe recovery zero rate and transform it. But now I have this issue here that the Monte Carlo simulation now has a stochastic end time, uh, uh, which is also quite difficult from a programming as, uh, aspect. Uh, so, you know, I, I'm a programmer. So how would you implement this that suddenly the sample pass is stopping? And there is a really nice idea that we actually split the simulation of the pre-default part and the simulation of the default um, event. So what we are doing is that we will model the defaultable bond, recovery zero defaultable bond, so which is here, as an object which I call the defaultable bond conditional pre-default. So this is now the P D star multiplied with a default indicator process. So this is here the jump process that jumps to one if default occurs. Yeah? So this is the indicator function if the time is after default. So you see one minus J jumps to zero. So I'm modeling somehow a synthetic object. Yeah? So um, a continuous object that runs on 
and I just multiply with this indicator function. So if I go back to the picture, so now the light green guy is actually moving, moving on as this P star until the maturity. And I'm in addition modeling some indicator process that jumps to one if default occurs. So maybe it jumps to one, but on different sample path, of course it will jump at different times. Yeah? So now this is maybe that guy. And maybe this here is that guy, okay? So I now split my definition of the defaultable bond in two parts. The defaultable bond conditional non-default and the default indicator. And now I can assume an E2 process for this defaultable bond conditional non-default. So that's my continuous part. I assume an E2 process and that guy runs over the whole time until maybe then the maturity, yeah, which is an easy time horizon, not a stochastic time horizon. Yeah, okay. That's uh, also an, an, a nice trick to um, write down this model. And now we have the question, okay, what is actually the risk neutral drift of this guy, the defaultable bond conditional non-default. If I know that the defaultable bond divided by the numerea is a martingale. Yeah? So actually I have to look at this whole object yeah, in the derivation of the drift. So it was already in my little picture. I'm redefining now this defaultable forward rate as the process that continues to run on. So it's the defaultable forward rate defined on this bond P superscript D star, you know, the defaultable bond conditional non-default. With this definition of the forward rate, actually we have the same representation formula that represents now a defaultable bond in terms of the defaultable forward rates. It's the short period bond multiplied with the product of the forward rate for all the future rates. So you see, that's just the same definition that we had before. So I have here my TI plus one, the maturity of the bond. Then I have my tenor time discretization. Um, maybe I am currently here. So in this period, so this is my little T. So then we have the short period bond. So the short period bond is here. So from here to here. And we have all these nice forward rates for the period. So these are here the forward rates and this is here the short period bond. Uh, well, maybe you think, okay, maybe there is some small issue because I have defined this object here using this defaultable bond conditional to non-default. Uh, so the one minus J, the default indicator, where these guys become zero, this is missing here. But that's not an issue because the one minus J is inside the sky. Yeah, so note that is not the guy with the star. This is not the guy with the star. This is just the defaultable bond. So when the issuer defaults, 
this guy jumps to zero and I just don't care about uh, this part of the product because then this guy is zero. Okay, that's, that's nice. So in case of default, the equation is correct. Conditional to non-default, I can use the P star. So I can use the L superscript D with this redefinition. Yeah? So this is now um, a new definition for the L. I'm using the uh, stochastic process that is running over the whole time. So now we have introduced the jump process and we have uh, separated the jump part and the continuous part. So we can model this continuous part here. And what we have done actually formally is that we had the original definition. So that was our original definition. Uh, and using this splitting, yeah, that is now the splitting, I have maybe formally just canceled the indicator, yeah, but of course, this is only true conditional to uh, non-default. Yeah? So then I can, of course, cancel this. Yeah, or otherwise, it's just one. Yeah, And you see there is no difference. So my quantity is synthetic after the default time. OK, so the nice thing is that my L is now defined on the whole domain that makes also the computer implementation a bit nicer. So now, next step, what is the dynamic? So this is then the question, what is the drift? And I already mentioned that we still have maybe the question, what should we model? Should we write down a stochastic process for the forward rate, or should we maybe write down a stochastic process for the spread? And I already indicated a little bit, maybe it's nicer to model the spread. And why Why is that? Yeah. So why am I now moving from the default of the forward rate to this spread? Well, the value of a defaultable bond is smaller than the value of a non-defaultable bond yeah, because yeah, you clearly receive less in some scenarios and in the other scenarios, you cannot receive more, you receive maybe just the same yeah, if, it, if it does not default. So I have that there is some additional condition, yeah, some additional bound and when you see such bounds, yeah, so it's always nice to have a coordinate transformation between minus infinity or have a coordinate between minus infinity and plus infinity. If that is not possible, between zero and infinity is also nice, yeah, but between some bounds, it's maybe from a numerical point not so nice. Yeah, you also know this from calibration where you do some coordinate transformations. Um, so I don't like this, this bound. And this bound actually implies then that the defaultable forward rate here at the fixing is above the non-defaultable forward rate. Yeah, because that ratio is just the, the defining the survival probability for the next period. And I would have to be, uh, and it should be that the survival probability is between zero and one. Yeah? So there is some um, constraint. So I have a lower bound here on my default forward rate. And when you then think of defining the correlations, yeah, what is the correlation and what is the volatility for these objects? It's maybe much more intuitive to not define these quantities for the two curves, yeah? but maybe just define the quantity for the difference of the curve. Huh? So there is one curve that makes a movement and you, then you can say, okay, there's another curve that is on top and uh, the curve on top has maybe its own volatility, but this volatility is maybe smaller. Huh? So it's sometimes really nicer to model the S also from the volatility and correlation thing. Yeah? Because you see that with this constraint, the lower curve, the L is pushing 
the upper, the defaultable rate up. Yeah? So maybe it's nicer to model the spread. So put differently, modeling the L, the direct modeling of the L, D is much harder. Instead, I would like to model here the spread. So we will model the S. However, um, deriving the drift is much easier for the forward rate uh, because the forward rate is related to a defaultable bond and the defaultable bond divided by the numerator is a martingale. So, um, and really the derivation of the drift is uh, really similar to what we already did. Yeah? We will be very quickly yeah, with uh, looking at the forward rate. So I will derive the drift for the forward rate, but I would like to write down the model for the spread. So that's now um, the next thing, the dynamic of the spread. I write down the model for the non-defaultable curve. So for the forward rate L, uh, it's just here our ETO, ETO process as before. So that's just our discrete forward rate model, the one that we have discussed. And also note, um, I have maybe shortened a little bit the notation. This sigma i of t can be any local volatility function or could also be a stochastic volatility uh, function. So it could be a log normal process is if sigma i of t is actually the function sigma i of t and l is sigma i times l. Yeah? So something like that. Uh, so this um, may be a local volatility function or a stochastic volatility. And also the same here, but I'm writing uh, the spread as a log normal process as a, with a log normal diffusion. Uh, you could also uh, generalize uh, this. Yeah? So I'm, I'm just writing it down like that and we will have a covariance term as we had before between these objects. Um, so, um, that's, that's just here my notation. So I write down the model for the spread, SI, okay? It's also just an ETO process. You see it has its own Brownian drivers. So there is here DWSI. So I can define also a correlation between the Brownian drivers. So there is now a DWI, DWJ, the inter default free interest rate correlation structure. There is maybe a DWSI, DWSJ, the inter spread correlation. And there's also the correlation that I can specify between the non defaultable. Brownian driver and the defaultable, yeah, so the driver of the defaultable rate. So you have a huge correlation matrix. Okay, so I specified this model, um, but the derivation of the drift is easier for the forward rate. Yeah, luckily the um, relation between the spread and the forward rates is very simple. So it's just S is L I, defaultable minus Li, non-defaultable. So um, the stochastic process is just the difference. And you see then the drift of S is just the difference of the drift of the forward rates. So it's simpler to derive the drift for the defaultable forward rate, this guy. Yeah, okay, so, so you saw there were many steps, yeah, uh, until we are now reaching the point where the model is maybe finally written down and we can just go through the program of uh, deriving the drift. Uh, many steps in the sense that we had the question, okay, what is the good quantity to, to model? So how should we split the default? Yeah. So let's go quickly to the derivation of the drift. And you see it's very similar to what we did 
default before. Yeah? So this guy is the sum of um, two E2 processes. Yeah? It's the conditional non-default uh, quantity. So there's no, no jump part yeah? that has been separated out. Um, you see that the drift is of course the sum of the two other E2 process drifts and the diffusions is also the sum of the diffusions. Okay, um, so if I have derived here the drift for the defaultable forward rate, then I immediately get the drift for the spread. I choose the numeraire that we also had in our non-defaultable model. So I choose the spot numeraire, the rolled over one period bond. So the risk neutral numeraire, if you uh, take the time discretization into account that we only invest over periods of length delta j. So sometimes I use here the delta j as a short notation. And we will now derive the corresponding processes, so the drift under this uh, numeraire. So the dynamic of this part here, the dynamic of this part is already known. It is our discrete forward rate model. So I only need this additional part here, um, the spread or the forward rate part. Okay, so, so the trick is always the same. Look for financial products where you believe the stochastic process somehow is related to the quantity. And um, you know that this defaultable bond, yeah, which is here a candidate of this product, divided by the numeraire is a Q and Martingale because this guy is a traded asset. Yeah? So this here is a traded asset divided by my numeraire. So this guy is um, a Martingale. Likewise, we have that the forward rate Li, defaultable forward rate, multiplied with the zero cobalt bond that matures at the end of the period is a traded asset. And actually we use the same trick when we were deriving the drift for the non-defaultable forward rate. We were also looking at this guy which made calculations a little bit easier, but without default. And why is that? The first thing is that I introduce my splitting into the continuous part and the jump part because this part here was defined using the continuous part. Uh, we had this redefinition. Then I can plug in the definition of the L and see that this just gives me the bond at the beginning of the period minus the bond at the end of the period divided by the period length, but now with this synthetic pre-default bond. And I still have my jump part standing around here. And now I can just multiply this jump part to these two synthetic products and see that this is just the defaultable bond at the beginning of the period minus the defaultable bond at the end of the period divided by the period length. So this is um, a portfolio of traded assets. So if I now divide this guy here with the numeraire, so this guy is also a martingale. So I have this guy divided by the numeraire is a martingale. Um, this is nice because now I will apply Ito's lemma and there is the drift of this guy popping out. So I have DLI multiplied with this ratio. And the drift of this part here is zero because I have already known that this is a martingale. And then there is the DLI 
dp divided by n part, the covariance part. And so I have the equation drift equals covariance part. So that's really the same trick. So let's apply Ito's lemma or say the product rule um, to this. And you see <clears throat> that we have the three parts. We have the differential applied to L. So there is the mu i superscript d popping out of this. Then I have the differential applied to this, but we know that this is a zero dt, yeah, because it is the martingale. So this is that part here. And we have the last one here, which is the covariance term. So it is somehow a sigma i superscript d, and then some other stuff, sigma, okay, is there maybe also a superscript d, j, rho i, j here, maybe a sum over different j's. Huh? And you see that we will get hmm, maybe a similar formula. Okay, so uh, what's this uh, guy? So what's that guy here? Uh, the stochastic process of the L part is known. Um, so let's plug in the definition of the defaultable bond. And I had this already on the slide. I can write now the defaultable bond as the short period bond multiplied with the product of all the forward rates, actually the product one divided by one plus L, which is always the uh, next forward bond, yeah? synthetic one. Um, be careful again, the one minus J, so the jump part is inside here. So if you now apply the differential to this, so I apply here the D to this. Uh, well, I have again um, a product rule. It's this stuff here uh, multiplied with differentiating this product. Differentiating this product is the product where one guy is differentiated. This one guy is here the part J. So that is removed from the product. So actually it's the product divided by one plus delta J LJ So that guy here. So then I can just write the product in front again. And you see, I get here the short period bond, which contains the one minus J and the product again. Yeah? So I get here this part again. And the remainder here is the inner derivative. So this is the D applied to the DLJ. Yeah? So this is the derivative of this part, oops. So this is the derivative here of this inner part. Very similar step to what we, what we did uh, before. Um, of course, you also need to apply the differential to that part here. Yeah? Um, so which is here and you have the whole product in front and then you have the cross term, the differential applied to that guy and to that guy. Uh, for the cross term, there is a DT maybe popping out, but really I don't care because there is a DL here in front. That will be a DT, DT, which is zero. And also if here um, a DW pops out, yeah, really I don't uh, care uh, because there is a DLI, uh, DW. So I'm, I'm really interested in covariance part. So I'm, I'm interested here in the DW. So note that I'm interested here in the DW coming up. So why is my pen not working? So I'm interested here in the DW popping out from here and all the DWs popping out from here. Huh? So I'm interested maybe in multiplying the DL with this part. Huh? And you see that looks very similar to what we already had. So I, I do not care about 
this part and also I do not care about that part. Now there is a little thing that is interesting. Uh, you see here there is a differential of the short period bond. So this guy here, but the defaultable one which contains this jump part, divided by my numeraire. And in the non-defaultable model, this part did not play a role. So that's here an old slide from our non-defaultable model. So that is here the discrete forward rate model where we were doing exactly the same steps and we were having here the non-defaultable bond divided by the numeraire. And there was the nice issue that this here is our numeraire. So th there was the nice effect that here our numeraire contains this short period bond, but our non-defaultable bond also contains the short period bond. So actually you remember maybe that this part here was canceling a part from this product. So we just had these two products, one product coming out of the numeraire and the other product coming out of the bond. So that was the product coming out of the bond. And you see it starts at this MT plus one. So at the end of the period that comes uh, where the little T resides in and the short period bond did not um, occur. So we had a small discussion in this uh, section here, the role of the short period bond that it is only for the interpolation and in the model it's magically disappearing. This is not happening here because here we have the numeraire and here I have now this short period bond, but it's the defaultable one. So inside in this term, there is the ratio of the defaultable short period bond and the non-defaultable short period bond. And if you link back to the other chapter, this is actually the survival probability, the ratio of the two is the survival probability for the next period. And if the survival probability is exponential, some lambda, then you see that this is actually the ratio times lambda. So there is the default intensity somehow in this term. And this default intensity is, if you think of jump processes, the compensator for this part here that's inside. Uh, but we do not have to mess uh, around with this, but those, those guys who know jump processes, this jump process has to be a martingale and the compensator for our jump process is actually inside, hidden, hidden here inside. Okay, <clears throat> so we have here an additional term. The additional term is that there is the defaultable bond divided by our numeraire short period bond divide, so divided by, yeah, so this, this here is the remaining part of the numeraire, which I can move in front. Yeah, so the accumulated, um, the accumulated interest rate. Uh, so there is this ratio, which doesn't vanish. And this is also happening in other models. In the cross currency model, there is the ratio between the foreign bond and the domestic bond, which is suddenly not vanishing. Yeah. Um, so this, this term, that this term is uh, vanishing happens only if you are in the uh, domestic or in the non-defaultable curve derivation. Also a nice little aspect that, that is happening here. So for this short period bond, our model is incomplete. Yeah, so we already had this remark before when we were discussing the short period bond. Our model is incomplete. We are just modeling the periods and we have no information what is happening in between a period. So the numeraire is, if you only model the forward rates, the numeraire is only defined at the period ends and 
starts. So at our tenor discretization. Um, so if this here is your tenor discretization and you ask yourself, okay, what is the numerea? Okay, the numerea is known already here if you just have the forward rates, but to calculate the numerea in between uh, the n of t, we actually need this object here, yeah, because it's it's inside this numerea. And we made already this remark, okay, we can make a small assumption. You can just assume that this object has, for example, no diffusion. Yeah, it's just a dt, so it's just a deterministic function. And then if it's just a deterministic function, it's maybe just a linear interpolation between the bond is one at the end and the bond has a certain value, which is one divided by one plus L times period length at the beginning of the period, you know, these two quantities and in between it's maybe just a linear interpolation or one divided by um, a, a linear interpolation. So you can make, for example, this um, assumption here uh, that it is just the current forward rate, one divided by the current forward rate linear interpolated over the period. So you can make this assumption and then the model is complete. Uh, and it also links to our discussion on the HGM model. Um, yeah, where you can define the volatility of the HGM model. And if you then say that the, the volatility drops to zero within the period, yeah, shortly before maturity, then this will exactly lead to the short peer bond having no diffusion. So we could make this assumption and then we could also make this assumption for the defaultable zero proper bond, defaultable zero proper bond conditional non-default uh, that we just define it via some um, interpolation. That's just a possible possible uh, definition. Yeah? You can also make this object stochastic if you like. Yeah? Then you would model what's happening in the period. Um, so note that here we are free to choose any interpolation and there's no, no arbitrage constraint that is defining the drift because the drift of this object, if it is a deterministic function, is the slope of the curve. But if you know the starting and end point, yeah, then uh, if you if the slope is, is pre-described, yeah, then the curve is pre-described. We are here free to choose this slope. And we have encountered this freedom when we were shortly looking at uh, short rate models. Yeah? So there we could also choose the drift of the short rate because the drift of the short rate was actually defining the interest rate curve, yeah. the expected value of the interest rate curve. So that's a little bit similar here, choosing this interpolation because our forward rate is for on, on this short pay bond is the short rate. So I have a small discussion here on the short period bond, yeah, but now it is the short period default of the bond, very similar to what we had uh, before. Yeah? So we can maybe make this, this choice. So if this short period bond has no diffusion, then this means that dPd star divided by Pd is just the dt term because both guys have no diffusion. But if I now move to the defaultable short period bond without the star, yeah? so recall this guy was with the star. Okay, because I, I did not specify the jump part. The guy with the jump part is here on top and there's I multiply with the jump part. I just choose this interpolation for the continuous part, of course, it's a continuous interpolation. Um, so if I now look at the differential of the short period bond, you see there is here some DT part and there is the dj, the differential of my jump process. 
And why am I discussing this? Because um, I still have here the DL multiplied with the D ratio of the defaultable bond divided by the numerator. Ratio of the defaultable bond divided by numerator contains here the differential of the short period bond divided by the numerator, but moving this product out, it's the ratio of the defaultable short period bond and the non-defaultable bond. So you see, you have here an ETO process multiplied with the D of this guy. But now the D of this guy, okay, it has the DT. Uh, so I have a DT, DT is zero, DT, DW is zero, but it also has the DJ. And there is the little question, what is actually the D of an ETO process multiplied with the DJ. And you know that this is zero. Yeah? It's because the ETO process is continuous and the jump is happening instantaneously. So if the ETO process is continuous, before jump, after jump looks the same. So actually I, I do not see the difference. Okay, so we need this little ingredients to actually argue that this cross term dl times dj is zero. And now I can plug this into our equation. So 165, let's go to 165. This is exactly that guy. So I plug everything in. So I have here the drift and here I have the covariance term. And we compare the drift terms and you just see that this factor here in front is canceling and the mu is equal to plus this covariance term. And big surprise, the drift looks exactly as for the non-defaultable interest rate curve. Yeah? It is the same sum because I'm summing over the same periods. Okay, it's because the product goes over these periods and it is exactly the same covariance term, except that all the guys here have now um, a little superscript D. Uh, it's the volatility of the default forward rate and the correlation of the default forward rates. So here I just um, make the assumption on the correlation. Okay, so uh, long derivation, but um, we could have just guessed that the drift looks like this. Okay, so why is that? Well, you could just have moved to the numeraire that is the reinvestment strategy into the defaultable bonds. Yeah? So this is here my defaultable numeraire. So I could maybe just have used this guy. And then you see that this system of quantities, numeraire and forward rates looks exactly as before. Yeah? The relation with the, with the um, uh, uh, yeah, martingale, the martingale uh, relation looks exactly the same. Uh, so why, why didn't I do this derivation? Well, because the derivation uh, is flawed. Yeah? So this argument is the reason that we get the same expressions yeah? because if you look this guy, uh, if you take this guy, also the one minus J and the short period bond is now canceling. Yeah? All this issue with the one minus J with the jump is canceling. Yeah? But the argument is a little bit flawed because the N superscript D is not an admissible numeraire because if we jump to default, the numeraire becomes zero. Yeah? So numeraire not equal to zero does not hold. So it's not an admissible numeraire. However, yeah, that's a little bit the reason why it works. Pre-default, conditional to pre-default, it is a numeraire. Okay, so uh, you could then say, okay, just use uh, the conditional pre-default numeraire. So use that guy here, um, but this is not a traded asset. And you also see it because the jump part is not canceling. So, um, yeah, let me conclude with one 
aspect. Yeah, before I do this, let's go back. Um, so now I have the drift for the L. Uh, then if you now um, write down the covariance term for the default with forward rates in terms of L and S, well, it's just a product yeah, of L plus S, you get four terms here, the, the intercovariance of the two and the intracovariances yeah, for, for both combinations. Then you can replace this covariance term and you can use our little formula for the drift, solve it for the mu S and you can write down the drift for the mu S. It looks ugly, yeah, but derivation the other way was much easier. So let me now conclude with one little thing. I did not talk about the jump part. And the jump part should be, um, yeah, a Poisson process. So a jump process that jumps with the right intensity. Yeah, it should generate the right default probability. So I somehow need the default intensity. I need the lambda. And do I have an extra model for the lambda or is that already in my model? Okay, so, so far our model only describes the pre-default values of the spread. And I would also like to um, have the default time. And for that, I need the default intensity. So I would like to model now the J part, the one minus J. The funny thing is that the survival probability can be expressed in terms of our model primitives. So our model primitives are the L and the S. So that is here on the slide. I can express the uh, probability here that I survive T, conditional that I have survived S in terms of the bonds. And I can calculate the bonds from our quantities. But maybe a bit more interesting is to look at the default intensity in terms of our model primitives. So the default intensity in terms of our model primitives. Well, I know that the ratio of the defaultable bond divided by the non-defaultable bond is exponential minus integral lambda. So if I take the logarithm, move the minus to the other side, I have here for the default intensity lambda, that the integral of lambda SDS is minus the logarithm of this ratio of the bonds. And if you just take T equal to the beginning of the period, you see that you can express this intensity integrated over the period. So somehow the average intensity over a period, you can just express it with zero copper bonds observed at the beginning of the period, paying at the end of the period, defaultable provided by non-defaultable. Each guy is just one plus forward rate times period length. So you can just express this in terms of our model primitives. So our model primitives are the defaultable guy and the non-defaultable forward rate. So you can calculate the average intensity for a period. So you can calculate the survival probability for a single period just from the two quantities. So the modeling of the J is clear. Yeah? So that the probability that we have a jump inside a period is one minus exponential minus integral lambda. So actually it's here this ratio of the two zero copper bonds. So we can model this. If you have the assumption of how the zero copper bond looks in between a period, so if we have our completing of the model for the little t, then I can also calculate the lambda um, at a point inside the period, uh, because I now have this integral here for all little t, so I can just differentiate this integral this, this stuff with respect to the little t. And if you know the zero copper bonds also with respect to the little t, you get some expression, yeah? So from, from your assumption. Yeah, so that was it. Uh, 
maybe in the next session, I can have a very short look at the implementation. The implementation of the continuous part is just a Monte Carlo simulation of ETO processes. And then uh, maybe we have to think a little bit what we do with our default indicator process. Yeah, we also draw some random numbers there and um, can simulate a default if you, if you would like to. Yeah, that was it for today. Thank you.